good morning, everyone, and welcome to our virtual neurofibromatosis info fair. My name is Carrie Muller, and I am with the Texas NF Foundation. Um, this event is a result of a collaboration of four different organizations, Texas NF, NF Midwest, NF Northeast and the Littlest Tumor Foundation. And our goal today is to provide you with education and updates related to NF1 and NF2. Um, knowledge is power and the more accurately informed you are, the better equipped you will be to manage your health. So um, today we will not have any research or topics specifically related to schwannomatosis, but stay tuned. Um, we do have an event planned in early 2022 that'll be for um, directly related to schwannomatosis. So I'd like to start our day by thanking our sponsor, AstraZeneca, and a huge thank you to all of our speakers that are presenting today and the organizers that have made this event possible. So we can get started. Um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Miriam Bornhorst, Neuro-Oncologist and Clinical Director of the Gilbert Neurofibromatosis Institute at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C., Dr. Bornhorst, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, um, so I'm gonna start everything off just by giving a brief overview on NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis. So understanding um, the differences between the three um, different syndromes, um, which hopefully will give you enough of a background for the rest of the day um, that you can feel like you're, you're um, not lost during the talk so that you have a little bit of understanding of these. Um, I do just have to briefly disclose that um, I did some consulting with AstraZeneca up until February 2020 on plexiform neurofibromas around the time that they were um, developing Coselia Go. So I'm going to start with neurofibromatosis type 1, and then I'll move to neurofibromatosis type 2 and schwannomatosis. Uh, neurofibromatosis type 1, or NF1, um, is inherited through an autosomal dominant um, type pattern. So basically what that means is that um, you have a copy of your DNA from your mom and your dad, um, and all you need to do is get it from one of the two. So you can get it either from mom or either from dad, and you're going to have the syndrome. You don't have to have it from both parents. Um, but it's also important for me to say too, that, um, you're inherited from your parents about 50% of the time, but about 50% of the time, it's actually spontaneous, which means that you, the child or you yourself are the first person in the family to have NF1. Um, but then after you have NF1, your children have a 50% chance of getting it. Um, there's variable expressivity, which means that you can have, um, very, very mild symptoms from this, or you could have a lot of um, complications or issues from NF1. So each person is very different in how they present. Um, and we know that this affects about one in 3000 individuals. So it is one of the most common genetic syndromes out there because it does actually affect a fair number of people. Um, it's caused by a mutation or a change in the NF1 gene. And the NF1 gene is a gene, it's called the tumor suppressor gene um, on chromosome 17. So basically what this gene does or what its um, purpose is, is to prevent overgrowth of cells. Um, and so if you have a change in that gene, you're gonna have overgrowth of cells or changes in the way that the cells behave um, because that gene um, is not making a protein that's doing its job right. Um, the clinical features for NF1 can appear very early in childhood, and then it can be diagnosed through clinical criteria or along with genetic testing. And I'll just show some examples of the clinical criteria as well as genetic testing you can see. So this is the new clinical diagnostic criteria. This was established in 2021 for NF1. Um, and there's a few changes on here, but overall it's very similar to the diagnostic criteria that's been around for many, many years. Um, and really what you'll see on here is the presence of cafe LA spots, freckling, um, you'll see neurofibromas, so two or more neurofibromas of any type or one plexiform neurofibroma, an optic pathway glioma, Lish nodules, and I'll show you a picture of this, um, but then this is new. They've added on two or more choroidal abnormalities, um, which is something that you can also see in NF1, and I can show you a picture of that as well. Um, you can have uh, CS lesions, so those are bony lesions, um, and I'll show some examples of that. And then also added on here now is a heterozygous pathogenic NF1 variant. So this basically means that um, you can have one of these criteria. And then as long as you have genetic testing that shows that you have a pathogenic variant in NF1 or something that's causing disease, um, then you can have that diagnosis. 
You can also diagnose this NF1 based on the presence of a parent who has NF1. So if you have a parent who has NF1 and a child who has any one of these, then they also have that diagnosis. So looking at what a few of these things look like. So these are cafe au lait macules. So you can see they're larger spots um, that kind of appear in multiple different areas of the body. Um, and then this one also is just large enough that it could be considered a cafe au lait. And then this is what the freckling would look like. So just small spots and the freckling generally comes under the armpits or it can also sometimes come in the groin area. Cutaneous neurofibromas are some of the neurofibromas you can get. These are some examples of cutaneous neurofibromas. They don't all look like this. Sometimes they're just under the skin um, or they, they're less um, evident. Um, and then sometimes they actually do come up and they're more um, obvious like these. Um, and then this is a plexiform neurofibroma. So cutaneous neurofibromas affect the nerves that are um, right next to or superficial, right next to or on the top of the skin versus a plexiform neurofibroma, which is involving the nerve that's deeper. Um, so this is a nerve that's underneath the skin. So you can't necessarily see it like you can see these, um, but here you can tell that there's something there because the arm is a little bit, um, or it's wider here. And you can also see this discoloration there. Um, optic pathway glioma. So this is showing an example of an optic pathway glioma in a patient with NF1. And then the Lish nodules just come up as these small, dark brown spots in the iris. And then the choroidal abnormality. So this is something that you can't see um, without a special type of a um, light. Um, and so these are the choroidal abnormalities that um, sometimes can be seen in NF1 and are now part of the diagnostic criteria. Um, this is the bony abnormalities or pictures of the bony abnormalities. So here you have bowing of the leg. Um, so you can see here that it comes down and then it bows a little bit there. Here you can also see that there's a bow in the leg. Um, and then you have pseudoarthrosis. So you actually have a change um, where there's um, so abnormal growth. Um, and this is very, very fragile. And so if you were to, um, or some, it's very common for these to fracture um, if you were to have too much uh, pressure on this or if you were to um, fall on it, uh, for example. This is also showing right here um, an example of pseudoarthrosis in the arm. Um, and then this right here is sphenoid wing dysplasia. So that means that the bone right here has not um, appropriately um, developed. Um, and then you can also, this has a plexiform neurofibroma along with it. So the bone is not very well developed here. And then you have a neurofibroma there as well. Um, so I'd also mention now that you can diagnose NF1 through genetic testing. So there's a lot of different NF1 gene alterations. Um, the last I looked, there's um, probably close to 3,000 different NF1 gene alterations that are out there. So um, very, it's very common for patients with NF1 to have a unique alteration or something that hasn't been seen before, or maybe they are the only one along with one or two other people. Um, in order to find these alterations, we will do genetic testing, and this can include both DNA testing, which is about 70 to 80 percent sensitive, um, or also a combination of DNA and RNA testing, which will increase your sensitivity to closer to 90 to 95 percent. Um, and so oftentimes we'll start with DNA testing, and if that's negative, we'll move on to try and do RNA um, testing to see if we can figure out um, what the change is in the NF1 gene. Uh, you can also use something called a chromosomal microarray, um, and that can't find small changes, but it can be used to find large changes or large gene um, deletions um, that you can sometimes see with NF1. And this is just showing an example of that. So here you have the NF1 gene here. Um, and this, for this person or for these people, for example, the deletion actually affects not only NF1, but it also affects a lot of the genes around it. Um, so it's a very large deletion that can be detected on um, different types of testing. In terms of the genotype phenotype, so we do the genetic testing and sometimes this helps with the diagnosis, but can that also help us understand how to best um, to manage patients with NF1? And there are a few genotype um, phenotype correlations, which basically means that we know the genetic change and we also know how the patients present um, that have been described. Not very many of them though. So you can see here, there's really only four of the thousands of gene changes that are out there. So there's still a lot that we need to learn about this. Um, the most common one or the one that we'll probably hear about the most would be the microdeletion, which I've shown you where you're not only affecting the NF1 gene, but a lot of other genes around it. Um, and when you have this microdeletion, because of all of the genes that are affected, um, these patients tend to have a fairly severe um, clinical presentation. So you can sometimes see um, what we describe as a coarse face. Um, you can see a broad nose oftentimes, multiple neurofibromas, ADHD, you can have some cognitive impairment with this. Um, and then you also 
know um, one thing that we watch in particular is that there is an increased risk of malignancy. And so patients with a microdeletion need to be monitored very, very closely for this. Um, Missense mutations in these particular areas are actually associated um, more so with spinal neurofibromas. So that's something that we will watch for a little bit more closely with this um, and also have a higher risk for scoliosis and skeletal abnormalities. Um, these patients can also get the optic pathway gliomas. Um, so kind of looking at for these types of things will be important. Um, there are some patients that have a more mild phenotype. So this particular change, for example, is associated with really just cathelase and freckling, but nothing um, much beyond that. And then you have this missense mutation here, this um, 1809 missense mutation, um, where you can actually have what's called Noonan features. Um, so a lot of times you can get pulmonic stenosis, which is less common in NF1, but it's fairly common in a syndrome called Noonan syndrome. Um, and these patients have learning delays, but they have a lower risk of plexiform neurofibromas and optic pathway gliomas. So in general, I mean, that was more specific in terms of the gene type, but what do you see in NF1? And so this is just a summary of everything you can see in NF1. And as you can see here, NF1 can affect pretty much every part of the body. Um, and that's why when you're diagnosed with NF1, you have to see, or we, we recommend that you see a provider at least on a yearly basis to make sure that we're monitoring all of these different parts um, for anything that could potentially um, be problematic for you. Um, so here in the central nervous system, again, you can have seizures, headaches, you can have tumors, um, developmental delays. Um, it, for the eyes, you can have visual impairment, optic gliomas, lish nodules, um, you know, skin. Of course, we talked about the cafe lay spots and the freckling. You can get itching. That's also fairly common. Um, we talked about the bone abnormalities. GI, it's not uncommon to have abdominal pain, vomiting, chronic constipation, or chronic diarrhea. Um, kidneys, we can see something called renal artery stenosis and hypertension that comes with that. Um, oh, I put bone on there twice. I apologize. And then other things that you could sometimes see would be short stature. Um, and then patients with NF1 to have tend to have lower weights, um, and issues with puberty, either early or delayed. Um, and then I have other cancers on here as well. There is a, a set or what's thought to be a set timeline in NF1 on when or how things present. So also as your senior provider, um, as your child is developing, you'll notice that they'll pay more attention to certain things as your child um, grows up. So when they're really, really young, oftentimes what we're looking for are cafe lay spots, neurofibromas, and then we're also looking for pseudoarthrosis. But then as a child gets older, we'll start to see some other things show up. Like you'll see macrocephalus, for example, um, you will see um, decreased growth. Um, you can see Lish nodules. Um, and then you will also see on the MRI uh, these T2 bright lesions that really don't have a significance, but they'll show up. Um, and then other malignancies can be common during this age. And then as you get older in your older childhood years, that's when we start to see the skin neurofibromas that I showed you, the scoliosis. And then beyond that in adolescence and adulthood, you'll see MPNSTs um, and some of the other tumors that um, will show up. I do want to just take one second to talk about something called mosaic. Sorry, what was that? Okay. Sorry, um, that was me. Um, so I just want to take a second to talk about mosaic or segmental NF1. Um, and with the mosaic or segmental NF1, what happens basically is you have the egg and the sperm, they go together and they form a cell. And then that cell becomes two cells and four cells and then multiple different cells. And at some point during the division, you'll actually have a change in one particular cell, which then forms a bunch of other cells, but not every single cell is affected. And so with this mosaic type of NF1, because not all of the cells have that change, it actually is a more mild um, uh, phenotype. And so this patient, for example, really only has involvement of this part of the body um, while everything else is not involved. Um, and so you'll hear this sometimes mosaic um, segmental generally mean is more associated with just that particular part of the skin. Mosaic can also include other parts of the body. So you can have a mosaic NF1 um, where you can have brain involvement and skin involvement, for example. It's just that all of the cells in the body are not affected. Um, and this will also be important for NF2 and schwannomatosis because you can see mosaicism in those um, syndromes as well.
Um, so what are the tumors that are associated with NF1? Um, so we can see optic pathway gliomas or other gliomas in the brain. Um, you can see plexiform neurofibromas, and this is sort of showing an example of what that might look like on an MRI. Um, these higher grade tumors are something that we can see rarely, but they are there. Um, so we do want to make sure that we watch for those. And then there's some other very rare things that can come up, um, including a specific type of leukemia um, and some other types of uh, tumors. Um, and in adulthood, actually breast cancer is something that you can see in women. So it's important for women with NF1 to uh, monitor themselves for breast cancer. So how do these tumors form? So you start with a change with your germline NF1, you start with a change in one of those NF1 genes, but the other one is working just fine. And so that would be normal function. So most of the cells in your body actually have normal function, but then what happens is there becomes a change in that other gene. So all of a sudden your um, cells are not making that protein properly, or this um, neurofibromin protein that's supposed to be there is not doing its job like it's supposed to. So generally what happens is you get a signal to the cell. Once the cell gets that signal, it goes to different pathways. And once it goes through those pathways, it makes the cell divide. So neurofibromin's job is to tell the cell, yes, now is a good time for you to divide or no, now is a really bad time for you to divide and to shut that down. But if that neurofibromin protein is not working at all, if it's not functioning properly, those signals are going to get through whether they're supposed to or not. And so what happens is you get um, growth of cells that aren't necessarily supposed to be growing. So while you're supposed to have just a nice layer of cells, for example, you can get a cluster of cells and that's how the, the tumors will form. Um, so that is important for us in terms of treatment, because what we want to do is we want to think about how those um, cells are, are dividing and, and growing and what we can do to stop that. Um, and there's a number of different ways that we can do this. Um, surgery, of course, is something we can do where we just take that clump of cells out. Um, chemotherapy can be used to um, help inhibit or decrease the growth of those cells. And that's particularly helpful for the brain tumors. Um, oral targeted therapy is something I'll talk about in a minute, but this is something that's newer that we're discovering with um, all of NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis. And then um, just for other general things, you can use pain medications to help with pain. You can sometimes do no treatment because sometimes these clusters of cells aren't causing problems. You don't have to treat them. And then of course, radiation therapy is at the very bottom because we don't necessarily want to use this, but it's a possibility. Um, so some of the targeted treatments that are available. Um, so what we're looking at is this pathway again, and how we can change that signal or keep that signal from getting to the cell and keep those cells from dividing. So MEK inhibitors target this path or this particular protein here and stop the signal there. mTOR inhibitors stop the signal here. Receptor kinesine kinase inhibitors stop the signal actually before it even gets into the cell. Um, and then we also will sometimes use therapies that affect the immune response. So PEG interferon, for example, and poly ICLC, um, because those particular therapies can affect the um, microenvironment or the immune response. And a lot of the tumor actually is immune cells. So if you can keep those immune cells from coming from the tumor, it actually can be very beneficial. And then one thing I just kind of want to mention on this slide is that um, Cosalugo is the only FDA approved treatment for all of the neurofibromatoses. So NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis. Um, and that is a MEK inhibitor that affects this particular chain protein right here. Um, so NF2, we're moving on to NF2 now. Um, NF2 is an autosomal dominant um, syndrome as well. And similar to NF1, about 50% of the time it's spontaneous and about 50% of the time it's inherited. This affects about one in 25,000 people. So much less common than what you'll see with NF1. And this is caused by mutation in the NF2 gene. So instead of NF1, it's the NF2 gene. And this was on chromosome 22 instead of um, 17. The clinical features of NF2 are a little bit different than those in NF1. In NF1, you'll start to see them very early in childhood, but in NF2, oftentimes we won't see things until late teen to early adult years. And so it's not uncommon for patients to be di diagnosed with NF2, even after they've left school or left high school and they get into college. The NF2 diagnostic criteria that um, most recent NF1 di or NF2 diagnostic criteria are listed here. So this changes a lot sort of depending on what we learn about NF2. Um, but I think the most important here is that if you have bilateral vestibular schwannomas, which is the most common thing in NF2, then you have a diagnosis. You don't need any other features. 
Now, if you have a first degree relative, like a parent, for example, with NF2, then you could have bilateral schwannomas, you could have a unilateral schwannoma, or you could have any two of these. You could have a meningioma schwannoma, pendymoma, or juvenile cataract. So it's a little bit easier to get that diagnosis if you have a relative. And it's very similar for if you have a unilateral schwannoma, you can also just have two of these or multiple meningiomas, it's the same type of a thing. And so what do these look like? So vestibular schwannomas are schwannomas or type tumors that affect your, um, your hearing nerves or your acoustic nerves. Um, and so these are the ones that help you to be able to hear. And so they're, they're located in this area. So you can see that this person has a tumor on both sides here. So that would be a bilateral um, vestibular schwannoma. This person has NF2 just based on that diagnostic criteria. This person only has one tumor. So this side looks really good, but this side has a tumor. So for that patient, you would need to have another criteria. Meningiomas oftentimes will kind of sit. So the meninges is actually the layer of protective cells that goes around your brain. Um, so that way your, your brain is able to move freely if it needs to. Um, and it's very protective to, um, you know, for um, making sure that you can, um, or it, it's, it's protective of the brain. So the, the meningiomas will form oftentimes in this area. And you'll see this person has multiple different meningiomas that have formed kind of along that meninges. Appendomomas can form either in the brain or in the spinal cord. So this is an example of an appendomoma in the spinal cord, and this one's actually causing compression of that cord, um, which is a, a common complication and something we need to monitor for. Um, and then schwannomas can also appear pretty much anywhere, um, but this is showing an example of a schwannoma in the leg, um, but you can also get these in the brain and the spinal cord. Cataracts are a little bit different. Um, so this would be the normal eye and cataract basically is where you get that cloudy um, appearance of the eye and you have a little bit difficulty seeing because of that. Um, and with NF2, it's not uncommon to get cataracts very early on in life. Um, for NF2, genetic testing is also a possibility. Um, and we do actually know a fair amount about the um, genotype phenotype. So how the genetic results can help us determine how severe the, um, the presentation or the clinical presentation is going to be. And this is a chart that's um, fairly long and complicated, but I think what's most important here is that, you know, if we find a certain type of NF2 change, so for example, a change in exons two to 13, we know that the phenotype or that patients are gonna have a more um, severe clinical um, phenotype or presentation versus some other ones where it can actually be more mild. And so this is really important for clinicians because they're able to better manage or follow patients based on how they expect them to respond or how they expect them to present. Some of the things that you can see with NF2 in terms of clinical presentation, you can see vision changes, um, again, the vestibular schwannoma. So those um, tumors that form on those um, hear, the hearing ears um, can cause hearing loss. It can cause ringing in the ears. You can also get dizziness because of that. Um, and then depending on how big they get, sometimes you can have hoarseness or difficulty speaking and facial palsy. So your face um, will droop a little bit. Um, you can definitely get pain um, with NF2, and then there's neurological symptoms that can include any of these. Um, and then you also can have skin findings. So every once in a while, you will see cafe lace spots, as well as these little um, skin spots that are like um, very similar to the cutaneous neurofibromas in NF1 um, that are uh, skin schwannomas instead. Treatment op options for NF2 are very similar to NF1. You can have surgery, which is the most common treatment option. You can also have to oral targeted therapy, and I'll um, show you a few examples of that. Pain medications are fairly um, common, especially when you do start to get the pain associated with the NF2. Um, you can also do no treatment again, so just kind of monitoring for symptoms, especially if there's no um, issues with any of the, the tumors that you have. And then radiation therapy, again, is at the bottom because it's used, but um, we try to use it sparingly. Some of the, this is just showing examples of some of the targeted treatment options that you'll see with NF2. And I'm assuming that you'll be hearing a lot more about this um, and a lot of these targeted therapies throughout the day today. Um, but this is just a little bit more complicated. So NF2 is sort of sitting right in here, but you can see that NF2 actually is important for a lot of different pathways in that cell. Um, and so you'll get that signal to the cell and NF2 really regulates a lot of different things. So there's a lot of um, different types of inhibitors that have been tried for NF2, um, just trying to, um, 
take advantage of the fact that it has so many roles in the cell. Um, so examples would be tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which again will affect that signal before it gets into the cell. And then you can have mTOR inhibitors, which is similar to what I talked about in NF1. Um, VEGF inhibitors like Avastin um, can also help to um, inhibit the cell itself, but also changes the, the blood um, supply or the blood vessels in the tumor. And then HDAC inhibitors, which sort of affects down here. And then MEK inhibitors, again, which is similar to what you saw with NF1. Um, and there's a lot of different inhibitors that are always coming out um, for NF2 that we'd like um, to try. Um, so now moving on to schwannomatosis, which is the last topic that I'll talk about today. Um, so schwannomatosis is also autosomal dominant inheritance. Um, but I think for this one, it's important to note that only about 15 to 20% of the time this is inherited and the remaining are sporadic. So this is actually fairly um, common in terms of that sporadic. So a lot of these patients will have schwannomatosis and have no family history of it. Um, there is a high incidence as well of, as mo of mosaic schwannomatosis. So almost a third of patients will have that mosaic type phenotype, which means that only specific cells are involved or um, are affected. So you may not have issues throughout the body. You may have um, issues only in certain parts of the body. Schwannomatosis is um, definitely rare, and I found numbers anywhere from one in 40,000 to one in 1.7 million people. So um, it's, it's much less common than NF1 and even NF2. Um, and we've learned a little bit more about schwannomatosis, and we know now that in the, in the, uh, for those that are inherited, a lot of times it's due to a mutation in what's called the SMARC-B1 gene, INI1 is the other name for that, um, or the LZTR1 gene. Um, and these are both on chromosome 22, which is actually the same chromosome as the NF2 gene. And then we have this pot, um, bunch or this um, set that's unknown, so we don't actually know what the genetic cause is quite yet. The clinical features of schwannomatosis most commonly appear around 30 years of age. So um, you're finding that NF1 is very young, NF2 is in the 20s-ish, and then um, schwannomatosis is even older than that. So you don't oftentimes get this diagnosis until you're well into your adult age. Um, the diagnostic criteria for schwannomatosis is um, fairly long now. Um, so we have molecular diagnosis, clinical diagnosis, and then there's what you can't have with this. And I think what's most important here is that in terms of the molecular diagnosis, um, now we're able to say, if you have a schwannoma or a tumor, we can actually do genetic testing on that tumor and we can look and see what the changes are in that tumor. And as long as it has specific changes that really meet this diagnostic or that look like what it should for schwannomatosis, we can make the diagnosis. Um, for the clinical diagnosis, you have to have two or more of these schwannomas, um, and then one has to have a pathologic confirmation. So you can't just see it on an MRI. You have to actually um, look at it under a microscope and make that diagnosis. Um, and then you also, I think what's important here is that the patients cannot have the bilateral vestibular schwannoma. So that is something that you see in NF2. So you have to rule NF2 out in order to make the diagnosis of schwannomatosis. Um, and that again is shown down here. This um, is really important that you do not have NF2 or you're, you've ruled out NF2 before making the diagnosis of schwannomatosis. Um, you can see on here that um, they only included, back in 2011, they only included a germline smart b one but if you remember, I told you there was two different genes, so they actually updated the um, clinical diagnostic criteria in 2017 um, to also include this LZTR1 gene. So now you can have a change in either the smart b one or the LZTR1 gene to make a diagnosis of um, schwannomatosis. And then this is just showing here too. So again, um, for familial, meaning you got it from mom or dad versus sporadic, um, this is sort of the percentage of patients who have LZTR1 or versus MARC-B1. And then there's still this um, group that's unknown. So there's still something that, or a lot um, that we need to learn about schwannomatosis because we haven't been able to find the change for everybody quite yet. This is showing, so for schwannomatosis, just kind of going into the genetics, and this is um, not something that, that you really have to know, but I think it's interesting because um, what this is, is basically it's showing that for tumors to form in schwannomatosis, you basically have to have three events. Um, and so the three, and then four hits, so three events, four hits. So basically what happens is you have a change germline, let's say, in your SMARC-B1 or your LZTR1 gene. After that, you have to have loss of chromosome 22. So if you remember, chromosome 22 includes LZTR1, SMARC-B1, and NF2. So once you lose that, you lose function of all of those genes. And so now you have a change here and a change there, but also loss of 22. Once you lose that, then you also will lose NF2 function. And so essentially in that tumor, you do not have 
either SMARC-B1 or NF2 function or LZTR1 and NF2 function. Um, and that's how the tumor forms. So it's fairly complicated and there's a lot of events that have to happen for these tumors to form. Um, but this also is partly why wishwanomatosis is a little harder for us to develop targeted therapies because there's so many different genetic events that are happening versus NF1 and NF2 where we know there's specific pathways that we can try and just inhibit at one or two pathways. Um, another thing that I just want to point out too, is that, um, for most of these tumors, you have to lose NF2, um, in order to get the tumor, except with the exception of these LZTR1 germline mutations, where you can actually have LZTR1 mutation, um, and then you can have a fusion event. So this is a very classic fusion event. Um, this is just showing a patient, um, that I had, um, at Children's who had a um, fusion between this gene, this SH3PXD2A and the HTRA1 gene, um, in a tumor. Um, and this is actually chromosome 22, which looks completely normal. So NF2 is fine in this patient, but they did still develop a tumor because of these two events. Um, so with tronomatosis, the clinical presentation, um, you can get weakness, headaches, lumps or swollen areas on the body, which is where the tumors are, numbness or tingling, depending on where they are. So if you have a tumor in your leg, for example, you might have numbness or tingling in the leg, vision changes, difficulty with urination or going to the bathroom. And then sometimes they can affect your face as well as your smile and pain. Treatment options for um, schwannomatosis, as I mentioned, um, are, there aren't very many. So a lot of times it's pain management and monitoring, unfortunately, um, and then surgery when you need to. Um, there are a few clinical trials that are out there. There's one for this um, particular medication, which is an antibody against this um, nerve growth factor. Um, and that's really targeting the pain with schwannomatosis though, and not necessarily the tumors. And then there's an immunotherapy clinical trial that I found in um, China that, that looks interesting. Uh, but like I said, there's not a lot of um, trials right now for this. So just to kind of summarize everything, um, I want to give you just a quick overview of the three different syndromes together. Um, you can see that the, these are the three different syndromes and the genes that are affected, the incidence and the age that you'll start to see the, um, the, the symptoms present the classic presentation. So all three of these will have tumors, but a lot of the other features are very different. The other thing I just wanna point out is that all three of these, you can have pain. Pain is a very important thing that we need to learn how to manage better with these three syndromes. Um, this is just showing the different tumor types you can see, um, and then the types of therapy that are fairly common. Um, and then the last slide, I just want to say that NF1, NF2, and tronomatosis are three distinct syndromes. They have different genetic underlying causes, but the more we learn about this, the better we are able to find treatments um, for each particular syndrome. Um, and yet we still have a lot to learn. And so, you know, today you're going to learn about a lot of the new research that's out there for these three different syndromes. Um, but there's a lot of people who are working on trying to find better treatments and better um, and cures for these um, three different or these syndromes. Thank you, Dr. Bornhorst. That was a great overview and comparison. It looks like we don't have any questions right now. Um, so if anything, if we get any questions related to that as the day goes on, we'll do our best to, to answer those. But we appreciate you joining us this morning. It's always good to have an overview and a review and um, also to understand the updated diagnostic criteria for NF1, um, but that uh, your comparison chart of the three is really helpful and useful. So thank you for joining us on a Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> we're, we're grateful for your time and um, thank you.